All right, everyone. So we'll get started uh, this first little bit, a little bit of housekeeping anyways. Um, and then we'll actually get into the bulk of it. So thank you all for joining us today for the last of our uh, webinars in a storytelling series. Today we have storytelling for policymakers. Some of our AGU colleagues who are experts in this are gonna be presenting. Uh, but before we even get started, and if you've been one of these before, you know the drill, but I'm gonna launch a poll and I'm gonna ask all of you, um, how confident are you to communicate with policymakers using storytelling? Any sort of storytelling, whether this is like personal stories about your hometown football team, whether these are science stories, like it doesn't matter, any sort of storytelling. Um, I should mention as well, if you're not familiar, I am Shane Hamlin. Uh, the rest of us will give proper introductions as we go throughout, but just so you have an idea of who this person is talking to you. Um, so yeah, if you're just joining us, I have a poll up, just kind of gauging the virtual room uh, about your confidence in communicating uh, via story to policymakers, policymakers at any level and any sort of story. Um, I'll give you all these about participation. I'll give you all about, say about 10 more seconds to, um, to answer this poll. Uh, also, throughout, if you have questions, uh, please ask them via the little question tab button, whatever it might be. We will answer uh, those that we can get to at the end. Uh, my colleague Olivia and I will be kind of pulling those together. Um, and then anything we don't get to, we'll follow up with and we'll let you know about this at the end as well. All right, I'm going to end this and then share some results. Okay. So uh, kind of on the front end from this kind of one to three, uh, not very confident, mildly confident. And that's okay. That's what y'all are here for today. So just some quick background on the AGU, the American Geophysical Union, if you are not familiar with us, we're a big earth and space science society. We represent a whole bunch of scientists and science enthusiasts, a bunch of journals. Uh, we have a handful of topical conferences every year and one big fat conference every year um, last year was virtual usually in person this year and probably moving forward be, be a mix of both within agu though it's chairing science program and that's what uh we do and that's folks putting on this webinar series we help scientists communicate more effectively to really any audience via any sort of mean medium mode um, we do this through a number of different ways you are participating in one of them we also do hands-on workshops uh, right now in the virtual environment. We have a ton of online resources. We are very active on social media, website, all of that jazz. So if you're not familiar with us, we suggest that you look us up and we'll have ways in which to do that at the very end. Um, like I mentioned, this is the final of our webinar series for this year. It's all about storytelling. If you've missed any of these, don't worry, we have a whole repository of resources, including recordings and videos and animations and infographics and all sorts of fun stuff that my colleague Olivia has just posted into the chat, um, that it's all there. So if you've missed anything, you can go back and watch it and read and, and partake in that. We encourage you to do so. Like I said, my name is Shane. Uh, I am one of two of the core sharing science employees. Um, we are the, let's say, science communication generalists. Uh, we do a bunch of a whole bunch of or a little of a whole bunch of different things um, and scientist researcher by training and now in this world of communications training among other things. Um, Olivia, if you wanna introduce yourself quickly. Sure, and I'd agree with you, Shane. I think we do a whole bunch of a whole bunch of things. <laughs> uh, yeah, including, as you can see, some multimedia on my part um, and audio more for Shane, hence is having a photo rather than a drawing. Uh, and before we uh, hand things over properly to our colleagues in our science policy uh, department, I'm going to ask just one more quick poll before we get into things. And so I asked initially about how confident are you to use storytelling to communicate to policymakers? I don't know if you've ever done it. Um, just to really cover our bases here to get an idea for us and also our colleagues who are the experts in this of what um, what folks' experiences are.
All right, most people have participated. I'll give you all a few more seconds if you haven't. And again, this is any sort of story, not just science. All right, so most of you haven't, and that's probably not surprising considering the results of the confidence. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop talking myself and hand things over to Caitlin and Michael who can take it from here. Great, thanks Shane and Olivia. So we are going to introduce ourselves before we sort of launch into our content. I'm Caitlin Bergstrom, I use she, her pronouns. I am the senior specialist for digital policy engagement uh, for AGU's science policy and government relations team. Um, I am an ecologist by training um, and I've worked sort of between the policy and the comm space for a number of years in DC. Hi everyone, my name is Michael Villafranca and I am the senior specialist for uh, science policy and government relations. Um, my background is strictly in policy and government. Uh, I don't have a background in science. I, uh, before coming to AGU, I did education policy. So uh, that's where a lot of my knowledge base comes from. Um, and I do a lot of the kind of government relations uh, for AGU on the Hill. So, we are here to talk today about uh, how to use storytelling with policymakers. So if you are to try to talk to policymakers, how, how can you engage with them with story? But I'm gonna kick it off by sort of discussing why we should engage with policymakers in the first place. I know that politicians can definitely get a bad rap and science and policy don't seem like they should intertwine, but just look at the headlines. I pulled a couple of these from the last couple of weeks just by searching some key policy terms, but science and policy exist together quite a bit. Um, they're intertwined in issues like scientific integrity, federal science funding or other science legislation, political appointees running science agencies, there's more local science policy issues. I think climate change has been a really big policy topic in the news and it's really important that scientists engage at the forefront of these with policymakers so that their voice as a scientist is heard and not misinterpreted by somebody else. It's also important to help make sure that science is a thing that's on the list of these policymakers. So if anyone has ever called a policymaker's office, oftentimes the person picking up the phones has a checklist of the issues in front of them that are the most important. So these are often things like healthcare, social security, and education, but science isn't always on this list. And we want to help give you the tools to make sure that it is so that your research is being used by these policymakers. Um, there's a quote that we use a lot in, in Washington that is, if you're not at the table, you're what's for dinner. And by that, we mean that if scientists and science supporters aren't speaking up for science and to policymakers, then nobody will and no one will know that it's important or fund it or support legislation. So just gonna go over our agenda for today. Uh, I'll talk about some basics of storytelling. Michael is gonna go into storytelling specifically for advocacy. I'll share some examples of storytelling in action and we'll give you a worksheet to help you craft your story to give to your policymakers before we do a little debrief Q&A and then share some upcoming opportunities we have. So first let's start off with why should we tell stories? I, I like this gif a lot, not just because I like The Simpsons, but I think that it implores this really specific image of us sitting down with our parents or our grandparents as children, definitely still as adults in my family and sort of sharing these stories. But there's a very good reason for that. Humans have used storytelling as a language for a very, very long time. There's a bunch of different examples of here. We have some Italian folktales, Mayan folktales, lots of different things. So this is a great way that we've always shared our history throughout time. And 
there is good reason for it. Um, if we want to get really technical, our brains love stories. Stories activate a process in our brain called neurocoupling, where the listener can turn a story into their own ideas and experience. The brain also releases dopamine, which is a happy chemical when we connect to an emotional event, which helps us remember stories better. Um, and a well-told well -told story can um, really stick in our brain and activate a bunch of different, a bunch of different complexes in our brain. So in short, storytelling improves memory, helps establish an emotional connection and increases trust. It really helps others see themselves in our work. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about um, who our brains trust and why. So this looks a little bit complicated, but I will explain. This is a, an index of social cognition, which is showing this range of good and bad on intellectual scale. So at each extreme, you can see that there is warm and cold and competent and incompetent. So you can see competent, but sort of neutral um, at the top there is sort of scientifically determined. Um, in between, uh, in between the competent and incompetent is sort of this honest but warm. So um, we see often see things as these um, good and intellectual, um, good social, bad social. So let's translate this sort of into occupations, since I think that makes it make a little bit more sense. So um, if we throw some jobs on here, you can see that the warmest and most competent professions are the ones that we trust the most. So this includes teachers, nurses, doctors, um, and scientists fall just in the middle between not too hot and not too cold. But for us to increase our warmth and therefore increase our trust, stories are a really good way to do that. We talked about that connecting in the brain and that's a way to sort of get people on our side. So let's talk about what's in a story. Um, I'm just gonna go over a basic story arc. These sketches are all from Olivia. So if you like anything, I'm sure you can commission something from her at a later time. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how you build a story. I'll throw a couple of examples in, but Michael will go a little bit more into storytelling specifics for, um, for policy or for advocacy. So we start with our exposition. This is your once upon a time when I was a kid. Here you're setting your time and place. So if you were maybe talking to a policymaker, you were sort of setting the scene. So you were walking down the street, setting things out, putting them where you are and where this story is happening. Next, we go into the inciting incident. So this is a dragon came, a disease hit. You have a need that arose something like our town flooded, we noticed that there was asthma increasing in our community. So this is an impetus to action. So then you have your rising action. So this is your traveling to the Emerald City, you're meeting the great and terrible Oz, fighting the flying monkeys. You have obstacle, obstacle, obstacle along the way. So sort of the meat and the exciting part of your story. Before you finally reach the climax, there was some kind of problem that was solved. The dragon was slain. The mystery was solved. Your discovery was cured. You were able to find the cause of the flooding in your town. And things can be good and happy again. Uh, you then go into your falling action. So if we're sticking with our Wizard of Oz, all of your friends get their gifts. Everyone is sort of coming to, uh, coming to a resolution before... You finally get to the end, which is your, there is no place like home. Um, and you can see um, the ending is a really important part of this story. So you kind of just, you can't have your story just trail off. And it's important you close it with something. So in this case could be, we are studying X, Y, Z and but we can't do it without funding from this agency and we really need this money to continue this critical work. 
So we can talk about some different kinds of stories briefly. So you have things like mysteries, thrillers, and personal stories. And I think a really great example of an impactful personal story is something like Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. She's really talking about how these different environmental issues directed or impacted her directly and her community directly. And these are really the kinds of things that foster the best connection and stay in our brains the most. So Michael will take it over now to talk a little bit more about how to take these personal stories and use them for advocacy. Thanks, Caitlin. Sure, I can advance the slide here. There we go. There we go. Okay. So as Caitlin mentioned earlier, storytelling has uh, powerful effects on the brain, which makes stories powerful tools for earning attention, being memorable, uh, and building rapport. And these benefits are especially important when the audience uh, you have or that you're targeting is a policymaker. And there are several reasons why the use of personal stories will greatly enhance the effectiveness of your messages to policymakers. Um, I'm just highlighting like three main ones here. So first, compared to other forms of a communication that rely upon facts and statistics, personal stories elicit greater empathy, support higher comprehension, and are more likely to motivate action uh, from the policymaker. Second, personal stories are a means of illustrating how complex systems impact li uh, people's lives, um, demonstrating both existing problems and possible solutions, uh, which is a very key to a lot of the messaging that you do with policymakers, showing a pro highlighting a problem and bringing a solution or talking about a solution. Um, and then third, personal stories are inherently persuasive. And beyond other forms of communication, they can influence an individual's real world knowledge and beliefs and discourage counter arguments. But not every, oops, sorry. Not every story uh, is a good story uh, for policymakers. As with all storytelling, uh, the best stories are uh, those that are tailored to their specific uh, targeted audience. Um, however, story and good story elements serve as a foundation for crafting a good story for, to policymakers. Uh, so before we get to the elements of effective advocacy storytelling, let's, let's start by discussing some of the basic elements. So first we have character human context. This is typically a person uh, or community. So when you're putting together your story, consider some of these questions about, you know, who is the story really about? Um, what does your audience need to know, or in this case, a policymaker, about you to understand what your goals are? Then you have your goal, and this is what you want to achieve from your story. This is what you want your, basically, your policymaker to do. What action are, they, are you trying to elicit out of them? Um, Consider you know, what motivated you, what were you really trying to do here with your story? Um, then you have conflict, which is what stops you from what has stopped you from achieving your goal. Um, in this case, you know, you might want to consider like why was it difficult to achieve your goal? Uh, the plot is uh, basically new ways that you try to achieve your goal. Um, how did you overcome those challenges? Uh, Caitlin mentioned um, in the diagram, the different obstacles. Um, how did you overcome those obstacles? What else uh, did you over, what else did you try to do to overcome those? And then last um, resolution, and this ties again with what Caitlin showed before in the diagram is um, basically what changed? How did you change? What um, what did you take away from your journey and your story? Um, how did this experience change you? Oops, sorry, did not want to go too back. There we go, sorry. So out of these five elements, conflict is, uh, I would say is the most important one. 
the other four are either build to or off of the conflict. Uh, great stories all have one thing at their core, and that's drama. And what all drama has in common is conflict. Um, and the ability to create that conflict is essential to effective messaging. So to find your footing, uh, a tip would be to identify what that conflict is and then fill in the rest of those elements uh, around the conflict. Um, so while every story has those five key components, a good story raises the quality of those components. Um, and components of a good story include relatability, and this refers to um, the audience being able to identify with the story. Personal stories um, in which your audience can relate to uh, you as the storyteller and your characters are more persuasive. So in other words, the more your audience, um, in this case, policymakers can put themselves into your story, uh, the more likely that they, you are to be able to change their opinions. Um, and presenting information that challenges your audience's uh, preconceived beliefs may actually increase their likelihood of shutting out the new information that you're trying to present to them or uh, elicit a counter arguing from them. So it's really important that your story gains uh, your audience's attention and empathy by demonstrating a shared perspective while also challenging their biased assumptions. Accessibility here is uh, related that it basically means that your story is free of jargon. I'm sure if you've taken any of the sharing science team's uh, webinars, you have seen us talk, you have seen them or even us talk about um, eliminating jargon from your messaging. Um, so again, watch the words that you, that you use in your story. Um, think about what words in your story might have more than one meaning. Um, and practice with your friends and family who are not associated, associated with your uh, field or specialty to make sure that they understand what, what you're trying to get across. Um, articulation. So, here, what, we're refer what I'm referring to is that your story is very clearly expressed to your audience. Um, consider that, you know, are you telling the story in a way that can really be, that is clearly heard and understood um, by the person that you're, that you're telling the story to? So again, here, it would be a great opportunity to practice telling your story several times with friends and family, um, just to make sure that, that what you're saying is being clearly, um, clearly spoken and clearly uh, shared. And a well-articulated a well story will come across as natural and genuine, um, which will also be a lot more persuasive in the long run. The fourth one here is pace. And this is uh, ensuring that the speed of the story is smooth for audience. You only have um, you know, a short amount of time to share your story with a policymaker. So think about, you know, when you're putting your story together, how long is it take, does it take you to tell your story? Um, can you fit it in 15 minutes? Can you fit it in three minutes? Can you fit it in five minutes? Um, what, you know, if your story is long, are there components of that story that, you know, you could potentially cut out that will still, uh, still leave your story clear and understandable to the policymaker without it, you know, going on as a rant? Um, making sure that you're, this also has to do with making sure that your story doesn't feel rushed. When you're speaking to your policymaker, you want to have kind of like that uh, smooth speed. It's very balanced where you're not, you're not rushing through uh, your points uh, and, and basically having the staff or the policymaker you're speaking with uh, getting a little confused by, by what's being shared. And then the last one is emotionality. So here um, it's important that the audience empathizes with what the narrative that you're trying to express. So what, think about what emotions are you trying to uh, elicit with your story? Um, how does the story make you feel? Um, compelling stories entertain and engage and they use emotion to spur action. Um, and stories with emotional dynamics uh, really catch your audience's attention. And in this case, again, policy, your policymaker. So now that we know what makes a story good, let's talk about what makes a story good for policymakers specifically. 
Um, in order for a story targeted to policymakers to be effective, it really should reflect these qualities that I'm sharing. So first is relevant for audience of one. And basically what this means is that your story speaks to the policymakers' values, beliefs, and experiences. Relatable stories uh, that speak to an individual's values, experiences, and beliefs, that those stories stand out more for people like policymakers and their staff who are already awash of, you know, in messages from uh, you know, various constituents and lobbyists. Um, think of your story as jewelry. You can't, you can't sell the same uh, design to everybody. So you have to sell it, you need to kind of pound it into different shapes and sizes and designs as per the preference of your customer. Representative and not extreme. Um, the, the story represents problems faced by many constituents, um, not just one. So here in this case, extreme stories inspire support for an individual and not a group. So you really wanna think about, you know, how does your story represent the broader problems within your community or the, the policymakers district or state? And then emotion relevant to the policy. So that this, here we mean the story connects um, emotion an emotion to a policy position. Uh, connecting emotion to a policy position gives that story a purpose in conversation. So thinking about what are those broader implications of your story? Um, what really needs to change in the community that you're trying to get across to the policymaker? And finally, the story should be paired with a call to action. And here the call to action is equivalent to basically the resolution that Caitlin mentioned. It's the very end of your story. This is what you wanna end with. Um, an essential tenet of creating stories is to be sure that each story has a purpose. So I, you know, to elicit a, re a response or action uh, from your audience. So without, without this kind of purpose or call to action, although your story may be inspiring, um, you know, your policymaker may not know what to do with all of that motivation that you just brought with your story. Um, so give a clear direction um, with a call to action. And remember the golden rule of, of storytelling for advocacy is to never leave your audience hanging. Okay. So now that we've gone over the components, let's briefly just revisit this advocacy storytelling hierarchy. So. Remember, every story needs those five components in order to engage your audience. And good stories, again, simply raise the quality of those components. But stories connect best with listeners and audiences when they're tailored specifically for that individual uh, policymaker. So, I'm gonna say this again, because if you take anything away from today's webinar, uh, we really hope you remember this. The key to successful, uh, to su successfully using storytelling to impact change is to know your audience and tailor your story to them. If there's anything you take away, please remember that. Um, when crafting any story for a policymaker, make sure you know enough about their office's issues, priorities, uh, and any current activities related to your story's subjects. Uh, doing your homework will improve your chances of getting a positive response out of your story. So what does this look like? Um, you can identify you know, allies and build bridges between the policymaker and you and your community by looking at several um, different factors and you don't have to use all six of these. Um, these are just some examples of things that you can look at. Um, so connecting to geographic region, whether it's a district or it could be even just um, uh, a geological region, if there's like commonalities between uh, the geology of the surrounding district or communities. Um, the committees, what committees is the policymaker, policymaker sitting on um, that reflects kind of like the, that policymakers' priorities and what they're trying to achieve. Um, looking at their policies, what um, maybe even looking at their platform that they run on if they're a new policymaker, what are those promises um, that they made during their election that they're, you know, 
prioritizing, you know, during their first term. Um, what was their occupation um, before coming into office that maybe there's st still passion for that particular occupation, even though they're, now they're an elected official? Um, what caucuses are they part of? And caucuses, these are um, kind of formal groups that Congress, uh, people in Congress put together um, around a specific topic. And there's tons and tons of caucuses, anywhere from like winemaking to science specific, like planetary science or oceans. Um, so, you know, that is a good reflection of what they care about, what their interests are when they join these caucuses, because these are voluntary. Um, and then constituent priorities, what are the priorities of the community? Um, these are elected officials that, you know, they are elected by their constituents. So they are going to care about what their community Communities needs are, especially if they are vocalized uh, prevalently. So definitely think about those. And so like, how might you do that research? So there's different ways you might be able to do this research. Um, one of the main ways that, to do this is checking out their website. Every member of Congress um, has their own website that lists out their kind of priorities and committees that they sit on. Um, if you're doing policymakers on the state or local level, they may have their own website, but you can also look at uh, the specific legislative um, website that maybe perhaps links to a bio of that particular policymaker. Um, looking at their legislation and voting record, whether it's congress.gov or GovTrack, again, those are federal, but they're uh, would be equivalents on state and local level for those policymakers as well. Uh, looking at their social media, more policymakers today are very active on social media than in years past. Um, so looking at their social media, seeing what they are saying about particular issues and topics or even at, you know specific pieces of legislation. And then if you're part of an institution, um, you have access to your government relations team. Um, they, that's their job. They're meeting on behalf of the, your institution or university with policymakers all the time. Um, so they can give you a, a, a better sense of who, who that person is. Like, what are their, what are their values? What are they working on? What are their priorities? So when crafting a story, uh, you know, as you put together the story, you're going to, that you'll share with your policymaker, I want you to consider kind of the following questions. Oops. So does your story feature a constituent or community from the, the correct district or state? Um, you know, for example, you know, we appreciate Congressman Smith's efforts on behalf of families in Rochester, and we want to share a story of a family here in the city who embodies why this issue is so important. You know, is this issue, the issue in your story, uh, illustrate the, uh, an issue that the, the policymaker is personally interested in? So for example, I know that Congressman Smith is a strong supporter of the tsunami warning program as we saw in his recent Twitter chat. And is your story timely or urgent? Um, does it re require any quick action of the policymaker? Um, so, for example, here is, you know, with the vote coming up, wanted to make sure you had access to stories that demonstrate just how important the congressman's position is on this particular issue. Um, so consider these three things when crafting your story after you've done your research. And again, do the research up front, please, and remember these three things kind of when you're researching for your story is don't assume you know everything. Uh, don't assume that your audience, in this case a policymaker or their staff, knows anything. Um, and you can always find a good story. Uh, research can really pinpoint holes in your story's arguments as well. Uh, failure to identify and deal with, you know, potential objections from your audience ahead of time is uh, one of the primary reasons messages fail. So think ahead of time. Think of like based on your research of your policymaker and their positions. What would those objections be to your what you're coming across on your story, and make sure that you're able to address that ahead of time. 
um, by having some idea of what those objections are, you'll be able to craft responses that kind of inoculate uh, your audience against, against those. And before I pass it back over to Caitlin to share some examples of storytelling in action, I want to share some final tips for uh, advocacy storytelling. First, choose one story to tell. Advocacy visits are short uh, and you may only have a few minutes to tell your story. Pick one story free of tangents that is clear and concise. Second, focus on the personal aspects of your story by sharing one to two details that make it unique and memorable. Uh, policymakers and their staff hear countless stories during a day and details will really help them remember you. Third, connect, uh, connect your individual story to your larger ask um, by sharing a piece of data about the bigger issue it represents. But this is just the, uh, this is the icing on the cake. Remember that the real purpose of your story uh, is to make your audience care about your issue as much as you do. And last but certainly not least, relax and have fun. It's okay to be nervous, just take a deep breath, stay calm, be yourself and speak from the heart. And with that, I will turn it back over to Caitlin to share some examples of storytelling. Thanks, Michael. So I saw that this was a question in, uh, in the Q&A. So Matthew, we are gonna talk exactly about some, some examples of how storytelling has been impactful to policy. So we're going to start with um, this example of who is widely considered to be the mother of environmental justice. So Hazel Johnson is an advocate for low-income communities of color who were disproportionately affected by environmental hazards. So after um, after watching a television program and 1971 in Chicago, Johnson learned that her community, the Altkid Gardens in Chicago, had a really high incidence rate of cancer. So thinking about this in her own life, her husband died of lung cancer in 1969. She found out that four other young girls in her community also died of cancer. She also realized that their housing complex had been built on the old Pullman Car Company Palace. So it was an old an old car ground. So she realized that some of these pieces and started to see some connections and, and how a few things didn't quite add up. So this sort of launched Hazel's journey into advocacy. So she started by conducting an informal survey of the residents of her complex in the early 1980s and almost everyone knew someone who had cancer. So Hazel then formed the People for Community Recovery or PCR in, um, to begin to advocate for repairs in her building. After this, she was able to conduct a more formal survey of the showing the public health hazards with the help of the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Public Health and a toxicologist named Dr. Robert Ginsburg, where they then presented this data to the Illinois EPA. Eventually, Hazel's story led her um, all the way to the White House after working with a um, young community activist named Barack Obama. And in 1993, Hazel testified before Congress showing the impact that what they realized was asbestos in the development of the building had on the people of her community. And the next year, President Bill Clinton signed an executive order on environmental justice. So Hazel was able to use her personal story of how this environmental hazard impacted both her family and her community, took it all the way to the White House. But we're not expecting all of you to get your stories onto the desk of the Oval Office. So I'll share another example of something that I think is a little bit more relatable to us all. So this is climate scientist, Steve Gahn. He lives in Washington state and several years ago, he set out to walk 1500 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail. 
he wasn't a person who was necessarily convinced that scientists should get involved in advocacy, but he ended up wearing this hat that said, make the earth cool again while he was on the trail. Um, while he was out, he realized that this stirred up a lot of conversations with, with um, fellow backpackers about what we can do about climate change and why we need more climate advocates. So he started what he called this water, wind, and fire tour and ended up gathering a lot of folks in his community to talk about climate change and talk about climate activism. Um, I think if anyone is a hiker or a backpacker in this group, we're not necessarily the ones that need convincing that, uh, that the environment needs to be protected. But what Steve was seeking to do is get his fellow backpackers to organize themselves and reach out to their members of Congress. So he got involved in the Citizens Climate Lobby and now works with the Washington Citizens Climate Lobby through Eastern Washington and Northern Idaho. So he's had 31 events with a local approach on climate advocacy. They've sent about 400 letters to their representatives about climate change. Um, Steve still takes this hat out when he hikes on the PCT to talk to his hikers about why it's important that we organize for climate policy. So with those few examples and the tools that we've given, it's now your turn to try to put some of these stories into action. So um, we have a worksheet that I believe that Michael can drop into the chat that is specifically focused on storytelling for policymakers. I know that Shane and Olivia also have a great worksheet that's just storytelling in general. So some things to keep in mind with this too is this kind of storytelling is really more advanced advocacy. Um, it's a really good way to kick off meeting with your policymakers and a good way to share your stories. But this is something that does require practice. So um, as Michael said earlier, really workshopping your story to a couple of different audiences is a good way to both perfect it and sort of call your nerves a little bit. Um, and with that, I think I kick it back to Shane and the Q&A is maybe after. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, Caitlin, do you just wanna talk about this one real quick before we get into more general stuff? Sure, sure. Uh, so we have a couple of policy sort of opportunities that are open. So um, tomorrow our applications for the Congressional Science Fellowship open up. So uh, each year AGU sponsors one scientist to work in the office of a member of Congress. Our fellow just started uh, last week. She's working in Senator Tina Smith's office as an environmental fellow. Um, so if you are at any stage of a career interested, interested in policy, um, you can check out more information at that csf.egu.org to find out more. Um, we also have a great community of policy and communications advocates called our Voices for Science program. Um, we have a policy track and a communications track. Um, those applications will open up at the beginning of December around full meeting, but you can find out more information about that program. And if you want our uh, monthly science policy alerts delivered right to your inbox or to get involved in our advocacy system, you can text AGU to 52886 to get signed up for our action alerts. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, before we kind of round this out and get to questions, I have one more poll for you. Um, and it's a similar, well, it's not similar, it's the same poll from the beginning, frankly. I know we've only been together for 45 minutes now, um, but I just kind of want to get a spot check of how everyone is feeling now um, in their confidence levels. And, and you don't have to be an expert, but what have you learned and how confident are you now to use stories to communicate with policymakers? Um, some housekeeping things as y'all are putting your answers in. 
Um, for anything that we've thrown in the chat or even like links that are in the presentation, you'll get a, there, the presentations recorded. Um, but we will be following up with all of you. This is a poor poll. I'm just realizing looking at this. Um, well, all right, it's it's one out of two. Yeah, I did this incorrectly. That's my bad. Two is more confident, one is less confident. Let's say that. That's my bad, I apologize. Um, so I'm just looking at this and this is not great. Um, sorry about that, everyone. But what I was saying before, is there's anything in the chat, any of the documents we talked about, the links, all of that, we will send a follow-up email to all of you in the next week and a half, let's say, that will have all this information. So if you missed anything, if you couldn't get something out of the chat, if you want to just have like a clickable link of something that's in the presentation, you will have that. So don't worry about that. Um, we will we will have that out for you. Um, and again, apologies about the poll. I do things quickly, but yes, two is more confident, one is less confident. It's not a perfect comparison, but we will work with what we have. Um, so with that, I'll give you all a couple more seconds. All right. So again, this is imperfect, but I'll take these results um, as folks are more confident than not, let's say, uh, to use stories to communicate uh, with policymakers. And that's great. Uh, I really appreciate you all, um, say, suffering through my technical difficulties. Some just general things. Uh, if you are interested in science communication more broadly, whether that's with policymakers, journalists, friends, peers, family, whatever it might be, uh, and you want to be part of a community of people who are also really interested in this, Join the Sharing Science community. It's free. You don't even have to be an AGU member. Uh, there's all sorts of resources online, some things exclusively for community members, like a whole library of like scientists, the science behind science communication, all sorts of things like that. So please check that out. Again, as a reminder, we'll be posting these links in a follow-up email. We tell stories through AGU in a lot of different ways. Uh, two of those ways are through podcasts and kind of these audio visual initiatives we have talking about the more Personal side of science, that's our podcast, Scientel, and the more researchy side of science, that's third pod from the sun. But if you're interested in that and you don't mind hearing mostly my voice, because I'm hosts on both of these, uh, please check those out. And then finally, the last actiony thing, if you like the webinar, but you want to have kind of a more hands-on experience, you think your institution might be interested in this type of thing, you can request workshops. We're doing them virtually right now. Uh, but it's it's like a webinar, except we actually do back and forth and activities and that type of thing. So um, please consider that. Um, you can find us on all the social media, all that thing. I'll leave this one up for now. Um, but with that, let's get to some questions. Uh, so for for y'all, what what are some ways to figure out how well a story is resonating? Right. So what, like in case that it's not, is it helpful to have like a couple stories lined up? Um, like what what would you suggest there if, if figuring out like, is this actually working or, or does this resonate with people? Sure, I can start and then Caitlin, if you want to jump in a little bit. So I'll start by saying advocacy in general is very complex. Um, we have to be very, you know, as advocates, you have to be very flexible in your approach. Um, you have to be, you know, be able to evolve your advocacy as, uh, you know, progress is made and, you know, strategies that need to be shifted. Um, it's also very difficult to understand and prove like what advocacy efforts led to any given change um, because of that complexity. Um, and it's also like those who are influenced by advocacy, like, you know, in this case, policymakers, um, they may not admit or even know which efforts persuaded them. Um, so, you know, again, it's advocacy is really complex. There are some ways um, in the advocacy community that, you know, there are, that people use to attempt to try to evaluate um, outcomes. One of the main ones is um, a logic model uh, development. Um, and that one that it just outlines the types of changes um, that you kind of expect to see as a result of your efforts. Um, but there's obviously like limitations. A lot of people, a lot of advocacy experts take issue um, with the somewhat static nature of logic models. Um, 
because the, you know, again, because advocacy is so complex, um, our activities have to shift so much um, and we have to be more nimble that more nimble than what the static theories of change can actually demonstrate. Um, and then another, another way is called outcome harvesting. Um, and basically this is just uh, an evaluation method that was, I think it was developed back in like the mid 2000s. Um, and this method is reflection based rather than examining progress over time. Um, but again, it relies upon uh, those close, closely related to the advocacy initiative that you're doing. Um, identifying like which outcomes have been achieved and you know you may not capture um, some of the outcomes that were ne not necessarily like list, uh, listed out as priorities you know you may not be able to capture good good outcome good or bad out outcomes from from your initiative um, so having said that I definitely think you know not necessarily having a, a completely you know, different backup story is necessary. Just thinking, trying to, as you're doing your research um, and thinking about, you know, whatever your goal is, um, having those tweaks kind of ready to go. Like if you need to tweak your storytelling, you know, um, if you see maybe it's just, it's not necessarily making that right impact, maybe just reflecting on that story and figuring out, you know, what are those pieces of your story that maybe just didn't resonate or connect with that policymaker and see if you need to tweak uh, tweak your story. Yeah, I think those are really great points, Michael. I would also add, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that you should prepare multiple stories. I would be prepared to pivot your story with maybe a different, uh, a different hook or a different angle. I, I think if you, if you're coming in, you're, like we said, your story should be related to an ask. So you should be coming into that office to say, I want you to sign on to this bill. Here is my story of why this bill is important. Or I want you to fund this agency with this much money. This is why this agency needs this money. So I think doing your research, like Michael said, is really important but I think preparing slightly different versions of the same story. So I think you can also just kind of read body language in a meeting. If somebody doesn't seem like they're paying attention, they might actually give you some direct feedback uh, often in staff or meetings with staffers. They might directly say to you, this isn't really a thing that our boss cares about, or this isn't a priority for them. So if you get that kind of feedback, I think you can say, well, I understand that, but what about from this perspective. And that might be able to change, sort of anecdotally change someone's mind. Um, you also always want to send a follow-up email after you meet with an office. And I think if you, I know that um, members I've taken to take congressional visits have gotten direct feedback from a staffer saying, we really appreciated you sharing your story on this. So I think that's, a good way also just to directly gauge that. Kind of a mechanics question for y'all. So specifically in um, meeting with policymakers, whether that's in person or in a virtual environment, is there like an optimal story length, I guess, um, as a maybe it's a proportion to how much time you're actually meeting with them to make sure that you're hooking them in, but also getting across the information that you want to get across in the usually limited amount of time allotted. Yeah, I would say um, it really is going to depend on kind of the avenue of how you're sharing your story. So if you're doing it in a meeting, um, a lot of times those meetings can be, a sh you know, really short. I mean, they could be maybe as long as 30 minutes, uh, but sometimes a on average, I would probably say they're like 15 minutes, but sometimes, you know, you know, they're really quick. You have to jump in, you deliver your story and, and they've got to move on. So, you know, when you're thinking about those like kind of elevator stories. Um, so really, you know, like I said before, you know, taking your story, thinking about like, what is the 15 minute version? What's the three minute version? What's that in between? And thinking about what are those core pieces that you're really trying to get across that maybe you can get across in like three minutes but if you have 15 minutes you can add those extra 
you know, flourishes and, and details. Um, again, you know, based on how your, your delivery, if you're writing a letter, you know, you, you know, your story, you can put it in there. Again, thinking about how long somebody has to read that, you know, that letter, staffers and policymakers get tons of letters every day and emails every day. You don't want to send them, you know, a huge long lengthy story. You want to make sure that, you know, it's short and sweet and to the point. Um, but yeah, just thinking about what are those different kind of versions and what are those like core components that are, are pieces that you're trying to get across. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think coming up with a, I would say probably a 30 second, two minute, five minute, little bit longer version of your story is probably the best way to do that. And then adding a little bit of detail to each because we've definitely been in the position where you think that a meeting will be really quick and they end up having extra time and they want more detail. So you want to be prepared or I've had it happen where a staffer is like, I really only have five minutes. Tell me what you need from me. And you have to give your pitch in 30 seconds. So this is where that practice comes into play. Um, that's really important to be able to stay on your toes and make sure that you're still getting those elements across in a way that makes sense and is still quick and to the point. Yeah, I like that idea of essentially having an elevator talk version of your stories for different situations. Um, we only have a few minutes left and I have one more relatively big question. So this is a challenge for y'all. Um, are, is there a, this is like a pros and cons question. Is there concern about telling personal stories and potentially like adding in that personal or even sensationalizing science? Um, whereas like, could that be a potential cost of storytelling that would outweigh the benefits of making that connection? Um, yeah, I think that's probably the best way to phrase that. Um, I don't think so. I think that being able to translate your science into something that's personal is a really important thing to do with science. I think that's what can often silo science from policy is saying that this is just this really specific thing that happens in a lab and you need to be able to apply it to something else. So being able to sort of make those step connections, I think is really critical. And like we said, people, people will remember if you say, this is what happened to me in this context, they're not gonna remember the results of your study. They're gonna remember the impact of the study on people or the impact of an event on people, not numbers. Our brains don't remember numbers. Yeah, I definitely agree with all of that for sure. Um, definitely, again, the key is to make sure that your story is relatable. Um, and, you know, I know some people might think it's like challenging to think about like, you know, there's so many various fields of science. How do I tie what I'm doing? You know, they, you may think your, you know, research may be insignificant to a policymaker, which is definitely not true. All, I think all science and research has its, some level of impact. It's just a matter of taking what that impact is and putting it in the lens of like, how does that impact, you know, the community and, um, you know, tying that to the policymaker so that they can see that. That's that's kind of the, I guess, challenge there with when you're putting together the story is really making sure that you're really making that tie from what you do and the impact of your research is um, to what the policymaker is going to care about within the community. Great, thank you both. Uh, that's our time. So uh, once again, want to thank Caitlin and Michael for being with us and for running the show. Um, lots of great wisdom there. As a reminder for everyone, we will follow up in the coming weeks, let's say. So if there's anything that we missed or uh, anything that we think of once we get off here, like, oh, we should have said that, you will get that information in the follow-up email. And then always feel free to reach out to us. You can find our information. You'll have an email from us. Uh, and again, thank both of you.
thank you all for attending and we hope to see you at a future webinar. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Take care.